see who's coming on. Oh, my iPad. iPad. Oh, wow. I'd like to have additional prescriptions refilled at this time. Press one. Who's, who's, who's calling their, their, um, their prescription place, right? Yeah. For, I thought I was out mute. Mm -hmm. Boring, eh? If you've got if you've got background noise or people talking in the background, you want to mute yourselves. But also turn on your um your videos so that we can see your faces, and that is in the bottom corner of the left hand part of the um where it says video. There you go. Hi. You want me to start video? You could. I'm sure it will be far away from it. Who's, who's, who's um, saying they want to turn the movie far away from it? Oh, that was uh, old iPad Muff. <laughs> oh, who is, who is Muff iPad? Who is Mary that? Tennyson. Mary Tennyson. Oh, hi, Mary. Muff you is know, my nickname. So Mary, I have to tell you when um, we, we thank you for coming to the opening night party. And when you um, were talking in the background, we said, I think I was the one that said, hey, Muff iPad, turn off, mute yourself. And Flula said, I'm glad you said that, not me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. We just didn't realize it was on. So no worries. No worries. No, oh, there's Roger and Ruth. And Claire and Julie Hoxie and Juliana. We'll just wait a few more minutes until we get everybody on and then we'll get started. Claire, turn on your um, your video. Also, Julie Hoxie and Margot, turn on your video. So oh, there. <laughs> there's a lot of people over at Claire's house. She's having a wine party. Oh, yeah. fun. <laughs> Let me see if we have any more coming in. Connecting audio. We are there. Yes, you're here. Who is who is oh Kara? Is it Kara Leonard? Turn on your, um, everyone's, uh, it, it's nice to have your, it's nice to see your faces. Oh, hey. There's Julie and Kara and Margot. Okay. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to um, actually get started with a few more people might pop in. Um, and if you want to, if you want to click on that chat button, you can always type in stuff if you like. But um, our tech director, Brian from the Mammoth Lakes Film Festival is saying welcome to everyone. So welcome. And um, I want to thank you for attending. Um, oh, somebody's got their mask on for social distancing. That's funny. Um, <laughs> Roger McFarlane saying, good on you. Um, so I want to thank you all for attending the Mammoth Lakes Film Festival this year. It has been a very challenging year for us. And, um, you know, we're, we're doing it. And the filmmakers are so grateful and happy. And um, it's so exciting that we're doing this. So um, right now, I've never done this before. So I'm going to intru introduce you to the owner and founder of Stella Reese Winery, which is Rachel Davies. And um, people are clapping. <laughs> so Rachel, um, why don't you get started and, and let us know how um, you got interested in winemaking and how um, it all evolved into starting your own winery. Okay, hi guys, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, so my name is Rachel Stellarice Davies. Stellarice is my middle name that my hippie parents made up and bestowed upon me. <laughs> um, in 2004, I started working with a good friend of mine who had a small winery in Calistoga, and he was running it with just himself and a cellar master, and his wife had recently passed away, and he needed someone to help with all the logistics and um, it was, it was becoming quite a, uh, it was growing quickly and he needed someone. So 
I came in and started learning about the wine business from, from the inside. I'd been in the restaurant business for many years and had um, an appreciation for wine, but not much of a real technical knowledge at all. So um, in 2004, I started working with a man named Greg Brown, and he had a winery called Tea Vine. And um, he taught me how to make wine, market it, sell it, deliver it, run the winery, everything from top to bottom. Three of us did that for the six years that I was there. Um, and during that time, he gave me the opportunity to make my own wine. He kept encouraging me to do it from the day I started, really. And it took a couple of years to sort of get my bearing and find a vineyard um, and start making wine. So in 2007, I bought some grapes from a small vineyard in Calistoga. Calistoga is the town that I grew up in and um, that I was living in, in the, at the time. And um, we found this little vineyard, um, about two acre vineyard of Cabernet. They were selling their grapes to Chateau Montalena for many years. And it was such a small vineyard that they finally just sort of gave the contract up in the same year that I was looking for wine or looking for grapes. Um, so we were just sitting in the local pub, having a beer, talking about wanting to um, find a vineyard and someone overheard us, some, an acquaintance, of course, in a small town like that. Calistoga is very similar to Mammoth um, in size and scope and tourist town and um, so they said, there's a vineyard right down the street, Jack and Marcy, they're really cool people. They've got great grapes. You should go check it out. And so we did that and, um, have been buying their grapes ever since. So that was 2007, our first vintage. And we started with the Cabernet that we're going to try in a little while. Oh, great, great, great. Yeah. And so, um, after that happened, how did you start the company and, and move forward with the, getting the word out about you and all that kind of stuff? So I was really fortunate to get the opportunity to make the wine for free at the winery that I was working at. And so all I had to do was pay for grapes and um, had somebody to help guide me through the winemaking process. I was already learning winemaking by, by being there and working and had my hands in the wine already at that point. So um, we brought the grapes in and we made about 320 cases of wine, which is a um, Felt like a significant start. <laughs> um, I had been doing the wholesale um, sales and delivering the wine throughout Northern California for Tea Vine. So I had a lot of connections in the wine world, restaurants and wine shops um, that I, you know, let know I was going to do this project. And um, as soon as the wine was released, um, they were on board. So I, I definitely had people, you know, ready there to sell the wine and support the, the project from the get-go. That's a very rare opportunity. Um, and I was really fortunate to get a start that way. So we don't own our own winery and we don't own our own grapes. We do what's called custom crush. So we always make our wine at somebody else's place. For the first six years, I made the wine. Um, and when Tea Vine sold and um, new people took over, I had just had my first baby and I was um, wanting to be home and be with her and ready to start selling wine. So it all happened at the same time. The first wine was released when the first baby was released and <laughs> I delivered wine with a baby on my back for the first you know, year or so. And, um, and then in 2013, my husband got into the wine business. He was an arborist by trade for many years and had his own tree company um, and decided he wanted to change. And he uh, began working for a good friend of ours, Thomas Brown. And um, so he took over as winemaker in 2013 and he currently makes our wine now. It's definitely a collaborative project where we, we both weigh in on everything and always have, um, but it's kind of cool to see the shift in the state of the art, you know, equipment making wine up at Outpost where Jeff was working for all those years. We have the um, access to the best equipment. And um, so that's really been a, a great blessing to have that sort of opportunity. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself. And um, when you find the opportunity, just, you know, kind of cut in. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then maybe we'll get to explaining about the wine. Yeah. So um, how, how do you keep the quality control when you are, um, 
when you're doing when you're you're making wine in, in that way when it's not really your own um, manufacturing kind of company how do, how does that work how do you like keep the quality and um, maintain all that so for most of the time we have one of either one of us or the other of us has been working at that winery so we're pretty much the only people who touch the wine anyway so it's sort of the best of both worlds having use of the entire facility and being able to make our wine there but not having to you know not owning it. Um, right. There have been years where we used other facilities and um, you're, you're less hands-on, but we've been so fortunate to be with places who allowed us to come in. And I've never missed a harvest day. I've always been the one who walks the vineyard. Um, I'm there for the pick. It's always somewhere around 3.30 in the morning. Um, and um, there for all of the, um, you know, pump overs. And so we, we can go and be a part of it, even if we aren't the person doing the hands-on physical work, we can, we can oversee it. Um, and we've just kept involved in every step of the way, every way we um, could. I've never missed a bottling, you know, we've, we've just always been involved. Um, that's, that's just how we want it. That's how it is. <laughs> right. Does anybody have any questions? Kind of raise your hand and then um, unmute yourself. Oh, I, I, I see somebody moving. I don't know if he has a question or not. Oh, I think he does. Yeah. Is that Hi. Hi. This, hey, this is Jeff and Margo. So uh, we're tasting Chardonnay and, 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 uh, and Cabernet tonight. Yeah. Um, is uh, and sort of Calistoga or the Napa area is obviously big in in cabs and shards. Is you, do you do other? I, I don't know anything about Stillery. So do you do other grapes that you contract for and sort of out of the area, maybe Carneros, so Pinots, and that kind of thing. We, we don't make any Pinots. We make Grenache, and that's the only other wine that we've been consistently making. Throughout my winemaking career, I've added a couple of wines here and there. I did do a Pinot Rosé, one, uh, two, two vintages. I did some red blends for a while. Um, I've had a couple of other sort of fun labels, and um, I've done a Cabernet, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot blend. Um, I did a label in honor of my friend and mentor, um, who helped me get into the wine business, Greg, um, a, a wine called Community. And um, that was a wine that the proceeds go to um, interest-free loans for other people who are wanting to start their own business in the wine industry. Um, so I've done some one-off things like that, but under Stellaris, it's Chardonnay, Grenache, and Cabernet. But we're always keeping our eyes open for something really special. For us, it's a connection with the vineyard, something you know that's unique and um, a varietal that we enjoy that's grown in the right climate. So when we found this Chardonnay, we hadn't done a Chardonnay before, but we really wanted to make um, a Chablis-like Chardonnay. So, um, so this is our um, first vintage of Chardonnay. It's the 2018 vintage, and this was from a small vineyard um, up on, um, it's the Napa-Sonoma border, kind of Mount Beater area. Um, it is a Moon Mountain a vineyard, and some friends of ours um, have a vineyard called Theorem, and they had just purchased that vineyard and um, offered to let us buy some fruit. So we just bought one ton. So that made about 60 cases. So it's a very small amount. Um, we typically make the sort of wine we like to drink. So um, I don't go for those buttery, oaky Chardonnays. I really wanted something um, that was kind of more mineral and saline and um, more Chablis-like, um, something that was a good food wine, but also stood up on its own. So um, that's how we ended up with this Chardonnay. It was um, aged surly, so on skins, um, and it was aged for 11 months in neutral oak barrels. Um, and then, so one of the kind of key factors in Chardonnay is malolactic fermentation. And that's a secondary fermentation that happens. And it gets that buttery creaminess, the body that happens in Chardonnay comes from that secondary fermentation. Um, and you can tell in the beginning of that secondary fermentation 
where the wine is going. It starts giving off these different um, um, aromas and um, the mouthfeel starts to change. And we just were tasting it every single day until we got to a part, a point where we felt like that's where we want it, stop there. And so we blocked it. Um, and so we stopped, stopped that fermentation from happening. So it maybe went through the very beginning stages of, mal of malolactic fermentation, but it didn't proceed all the way. So um, that's, that's how we landed on this guy. <laughs> so we should all take a toast. Cheers. Cheers. And we're drinking our, you guys are drinking your white wine and I'm drinking tequila. We forgot <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a quick question. Is it a hundred percent neutral oak? Yes. Yeah. Good question. I have a question. What is neutral oak? So it's a barrel that has um, been used before. So when you get a brand new barrel, they're toasted and you can choose the amount of toastiness you want on it. Um, and depending on what wine you're making and how long you're aging it and whether it's French oak or American oak or, oak or Hungarian, um, you, you factor all those things in. Um, and so neutral oak gives you a vessel to put the wine in. It doesn't impart very much of the oak flavor to it, but um, on occasion gives it just a little bit. Um, oak can also impart tannins, which is not something you really want in, um, in a, in a light, bright white wine that we were trying to go for. So it's definitely not a traditional California style Chardonnay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Cheers. I think, I think cheers. I think this is delicious. Thank I wanted, you. I wanted to ask, do you um, produce this every year, this particular Chardonnay, or is this just a one-off? It's the only time we've done it. We would do it again, um, but other factors have come in. We've had, you know, just crazy fires for the last five years, and um, so when the time's right, we'll do it again. I really enjoyed making this wine. I love having a white wine. When we do wine dinners, we have all these reds. We have back vintages for, you know, 10 years of wine, but um, never a white. So it's really been lovely to have this. It, it strikes me it's almost French in its lightness. Uh, is that, is that, and dry, is that because of the way you've uh, intercepted the second fermentation? Uh, yeah, so um, that can have a lot to do with the grapes. These grapes were grown on a um, steep mountainside um, facing the Sonoma Valley. So they got a coastal influence. And so the acidity is higher in these grapes than maybe it would be if it was something grown on the valley floor where there's maybe more heat or concentration where um, there isn't as much of the coastal influence. So the higher acidity I think has something to do with that too. The grapes were, you know, they tasted beautiful and had a gorgeous color, um, but they, but it didn't impart this um, really big fruity flavor. I, I do think part of that would have been um, going through the full malolactic. Um, so we don't do any residual sugar. So we let it go completely dry. All of our wines are dry. Um, but, but there are ways of, you know, sometimes if there's residual sugar, there's a little bit more of that kind of fruitiness to the wine, but that's just not how we enjoy them. Well, thank you. Appreciate yeah, thank you for all the good questions. You guys, um, it's, it's nice to have people really think about what you're drinking and um, thoughtful questions like that. I'm just disappointed that I can't order more. <laughs> well, you can. There's still a little left. <laughs> get in quick. So, where can they get that if they wanted to get that that specific? Um... So, we only sell this through our website. This is one wine that isn't in any restaurants or wine shops, um, and we have um, a handful of cases left. And um, I sent a little flyer along with your um, 
wine and in very small print, I'm sorry, it's like so small for my eyes. Um, there is a code that you should use on there to get 20% um, off anything that you order from our website. Okay. So to give you that, you know, friends and family discount. Um, and then we have a second website too. I, I, um, I'll give you the short version of it, but I designed a tote bag for myself with bottle pockets because I schlepped wine around quite a bit. Um, and um, I really just made it for myself, but I shot a picture out on Instagram and I sold 20 of them and thought, well, I guess we should look into this. And so three years later, it's a full on business and now bags pay for grapes. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so um fun things to look at on, on both sites, but um, yeah, please, if you're interested, we'd love to ship you some wine. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions about the white before we move on? I have a comment. Mm. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's really pairing nicely with brie cheese. Ooh. On bread. Do you have other suggestions on what it would pair nicely with? It's really great right now. <laughs> oh, that sounds delicious. Um, yeah, I think this is one that you can do with a lot of things because it, it doesn't have um, such a strong flavor profile. It's really light and saline. So I think um, this is a good one with shellfish. Um, and you could even do, you know, like a, a shellfish pasta would be really nice. But um, I think anything on the lighter side or anything with a little bit of spice would go nicely with this. Man, just for the record, um, it goes really good with cheddar and triscuits too. Ah, oh, nice. And puppies. <laughs> and puppies. <laughs> and manchego, which we're having right now. Manchego. And I just wanted to make sure that um, if that dog is drinking, I hope that um, he is or she is over 21. In dog years. In dog years. <laughs> She's 28 in dog years. Okay. And we're good to go. Nobody will shut us down. <laughs> Hi, Juliana. Nice to see your face. <laughs> you, you too, Rachel. I'm so happy you're doing this. Thank you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, Shall we move on to the red? Wait, I just wanted to say that um, this, this household is not big on Chardonnays, but you've got like huge people that are like, huge, wait, wait. What? Re re <laughs> people who are not into Chardonnay and are really loving yours. So hey. All right. Well, the truth is I had my come to Jesus moment with Chardonnay. And you can't really say that when you're in the wine world because everyone thinks that, you know, Chardonnay is like the most complex of all the wines. And if you don't like Chardonnay, then maybe you're not an educated wine drinker. And I don't think that's true at all. I drink wine all the time. I'm pretty educated. <laughs> um, but I think everyone has their own um, legitimate, you know, things that they, their likes in, in the type of wine that they like to drink, the, the way it feels in your mouth and the, the way, it, you know, your body processes it, all that stuff. Um, and everyone has particular tastes. So um, my philosophy from the get-go has been make the kind of wine you like to drink because if something goes south you know we've got closets full of it i better like it so <laughs> um that was what i told my husband when we decided to make chardonnay and i said if you make a big buttery oaky chardonnay you know you might like people love these long hour big you know butter bombs and they sell but that we're not making wine because I was going to say we're not going to say wine because, because we want to sell it. I, we do want to sell it, sell but it. we, it's a passion project. We're doing this because it's our art form and this is what we want to um, um, experiment, experiment with, with and learn and um, Somebody needs to mute, mute themselves because we're getting the feedback from Rachel. So, so mute yourselves, please. Thank you. I'm a loud talker. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um I'm happy that there are some converts. That, um, this, this, I made this wine for people like us who like um, the, it's, if you get to have, uh, if you have the opportunity to try Chablis, um, this is what that wine is like. And it's uh, worth experimenting with different styles to see what you like. Very nice. Did you have a question? 
If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and then ask the question. Okay. Um, yeah, I do have a question because with all of this smoke in California, do you see any issues with grapes for the coming year? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, it's a it's a heartbreaker of a harvest here. So um, I'm not in the winery anymore. My husband's a winemaker at a place called Ravana in St. Helena. Um, and, you know, many of my dear friends and family are in the wine business too. So we, we hear all the chatter and I see what's going on. And a lot of grape growers are, um, if they have insurance, and we, I mean, we were just inundated with black smoke for days. I mean, we didn't see the sun one day. My solar panels stopped working because they, they didn't get enough sun. And we were in a planned power outage, which was an interesting situation. <laughs> um, but um, the fires were very close to us, two miles from my house. We were evacuated for 10 days. Um, and the smoke just sat over the whole mountain where I live, Howell Mountain, and down into the valley. Um, and so that's very much affected the grapes. Um, not every vineyard is affected the same way, but people who have crop insurance are um, not selling any of their fruit. They're not honoring any of their contracts and they're taking the loss. Once you pick the grapes, then you can no longer claim that. So um, there's a lot of drama around that around here right now. Um, the labs are so inundated that you can't get test results back in a timely enough manner. So people are getting really creative and they're doing these micro fermentations and they're um, speeding up the process, fermenting just a tiny little, you know, glass worth of um, grapes to try to, to try to see if they can smell or taste anything because it's taking weeks to get, um, test results back and that we just don't have the luxury of waiting for that you know grapes it got really hot right before the fires and, and during the fire um and things started the sugars were going up the numbers were getting really high and um the flavors hadn't developed so it's really i would say in the years that i've been in the wine making business um the most challenging year. We've definitely dealt with um, smoke and fires the last five years. Uh, there's been other issues where there's been um, late frosts and things like that. But of all the issues I've seen, mold one year, um, this one is the most challenging. So um, what I have learned and what I feel like I should pass on to everyone is that when 2020 wines come around, what comes across your path is going to be good because no winemaker is going to put their name on a bottle of wine with smoke taint um, and no grape grower is going to want their name attached to it. So we within the industry will all be dealing with that within our ourselves um, and not passing that on to the consumer because I, I would say that we're all in it for the long game. So if we give you a crappy bottle of wine, you're not going to forget that my name's on that bottle, you know? Um, so um, that's, that's kind of the, the short answer <laughs> to that question. Well, I have another question. Um, it were, and you may have covered this, but were th this, this bottle and the other bottle, the cab, were those irrigated or were they dry farmed? Um, I'm not sure about the Chardonnay. I want to say it was dry farmed. I don't remember seeing any irrigation up there, but I didn't get to walk that vineyard a whole lot, only just several times. Um, it was sort of a late um, opportunity that came up. And um, so we walked that vineyard a couple times, tasted the grapes. When it got to be pick day, we were there and, and that was it. So I don't know much about the farming on that place other than it was farmed by somebody really reputable and the grapes looked great. And um, so the Cabernet has irrigation, is traditionally dry farmed, but we have the ability to add water to it when needed. So for the purpose of the growing season, it is dry farmed. If there is a, a big stretch of um, extreme heat and the grapes are, um, getting dehydrated, then we'll water them. And then that's a 
crazy process of like learning how the water is absorbed by the vine into the grapes and how it goes back and how long it takes because when you add water to the vines, the flavors um, are, are um, dissipated. And so there's a certain amount of time that you need to wait for the um, liquid, to, for the water to reprocess through the plant um, and for the flavor to come back into the berries themselves. So um, we've done it, we've had to do it in the past, um, but then we always wait and taste and um, so much of winemaking is just the vineyard, knowing the vineyard and um, uh, making calls with what grapes taste like, you know, that's, or what the weather's going to do, you know, there's a lot of, um, it's like a chess game sometimes. Okay, should we move on to the red? Yeah, I think we should. Let's tell, let's tell the story about the, um, how this came about and yeah, so this is um, Cabernet from Marcy's Vineyard in Calistoga. We've been making this wine. This is what we started with in 2007. So we've made it every year since then, with the exception of 2011, when there was um, late rains and mold. And um, I opted to, we made the wine, uh, and I opted to sell it and not bottle it and put my name on it because I just didn't feel like it was worthy of what we were doing. So, um, so that's definitely a part of, part of how it all works. Um, but what we're going to try now is the 2015. 2015 was an excellent vintage. We've been just blessed with great vintage one after the other up until this year. Um, as far as the fruit quality is concerned and the weather and it's all sort of the stars have aligned so beautifully for Cabernet and Napa Valley for a long time. So um, this wine is 100% Cabernet. It's done in 100%, um, it's done in French oak, 40% new barrels, new French oak, and then the rest is neutral barrels. So barrels that we've used for other vintages in the past. We use a combination of two cooperages and that's sort of where we've landed now. Over the years, we've used different um, barrels and different combinations, but we found two coopers that we really like. Um, one is super expensive, so we can only get a couple of barrels every year. And the other is um, a, just a really beautiful barrel. It's sort of the you know middle, middle range. So we um, just make the best uh, wine we can using you know the resources we have. This this vineyard um, is a two acre vineyard. It's on the valley floor in Calistoga. Um, it's an old, um, um, they call it a rancheria. So the Wapo um, Indians live there. It's a Native American site. Um, so we find just the most amazing arrowheads and all kinds of really cool treasures walking the vineyard. So I've got my two kiddos walk the vineyard with me um, every harvest. They just take a Ziploc bag and by the end of walking a vineyard one day, just one time, we, we walk the vineyard every day, every other day for a couple of weeks, then it gets to be every day. But every time we go, they get a Ziploc full of, of obsidian and arrowhead pieces. And um, so it's a really cool place to be. Um, it's um, all Cabernet with a little Zinfandel toward the back of the vineyard. Um, and we just take the, the cab and we take all of it. So um, we usually get anywhere from 320 cases at the max to um, 200 cases, I think is the least we've ever gotten, depending on what might happen in the vineyard, how much fruit's dropped, if there's um, shatter or frost in the early um, spring, that, that can affect things. But generally, we pick um, around this time, many years. Sometimes it's a little bit later. This is an early um, harvest for most people. Um, September 18th, today is my 16, 16th wedding anniversary. Um, and I just, I kind of like, because that date I, stands out in my mind, I remember, you know, how many times we've picked on our wedding anniversary because I decided to get us into the wine business 
the same year that we got married and now we can never celebrate our anniversary properly. <laughs> so, uh, so um, we've picked on September 18th three times in the last um, decade. Um, but usually it's around this time of year or a little bit later. And what are the traits that they should be looking for in, in that? Like what kind of legs does it have? What, you know, what, visually, what kind of physical traits? So this is a really fun wine for me because I drink a lot of Cabernet. It's what my husband works with most. Um, it's what is grown, is grown around here most. Um, and I feel like this is such an approachable Cabernet. Number one, because we are very um, deliberate in the amount of oak that we use. We don't want this to be a huge tannic wine. We um, know that we're in the land of Cabernet is King and that there are you know, many, many Cabernets, $100 and, and more. We are making a $55 Cabernet, which is considered um, a very moderately priced wine for a Cabernet, 100% Cab in this area. So um, we want this to be an easy drinker. We don't want this a wine that, to be a wine that you have to age for a really long time. So we're restrained with the amount of oak that we use and the way that we age it before we um, release it. So we don't age it for a super long time in barrels, probably 18 months. And, um, and then it gets a little bit more bottle age in the cellar before we release it. So our current vintage is 2015. We'll be releasing the 2016 this fall. Um, so I think it's a really approachable Cabernet. It's um, for people who um, think that Cabernet can be a little bit too much for them. I feel like this is on the, um, the sort of milder end of things. Um, folks who tend to lean toward Cabernet blends because they like um, something that's a little bit less tannic, a little less committed, a little less structure. Um, this is a wine that kind of falls in that category. I have to drink, I have to taste some now. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Does anybody have any questions? Cheers, yes, toast. Does anybody have any um, questions on the um, wine that they're drinking right now? Shira, just a comment uh, to Rachel. It really is very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love this wine. It's one of my favorites to drink. Um, and we got, you know, a closet full of it. The kids' closets are full of wine. <laughs> That's how we store it. Store what's at the house here, um, and and we have really wonderful wines from um, all the years that my husband's worked with some of the greatest wines, and we have you know Schrader's and Maybach and um, Outpost and all these incredible wines. But I just really like to go for our wine. I really enjoy drinking it, and I feel like um, there's some really interesting nuances with this wine on the aromatics. There's always, and this is, this is particularly this vineyard, not the varietal of Cabernet, but Marcy's vineyard. There's this really lovely kind of floral aromatics that we get. And I, and I, I don't know how to describe it other than like, if you've ever picked lavender and you, the flower smells one way, but the stem, smells another way. It's kind of um, got a little bit of a, it's got the sweetness of the lavender flower, but it's got kind of a green herbal um, smell to it as well. And so I get that. And then rose petals um, is an, often an aromatic that I pick up on this wine, which I just think is so wonderful. And um, it's, you know, got a, a really nice long finish. There's a little of this sort of tobacco and um, dark cocoa, um, but I just feel like this wine um, ages beautifully, um, but it drinks really nice right out of the gate, too. I have a question. Yeah. Um, usually with, like, cabs, they're, you know, like 95% cab, 5%, whatever. How can you decide on going with 100% cab? Because it can be kind of risky sometimes. It can. Um, I, we have the opportunity anytime we want to blend something in and we just haven't wanted to. Um, it just, 
for us representing the vineyard sort of the like thumbprint of the vineyard is what we're trying to go for i walk that vineyard every single day during harvest and i eat so many grapes that i have the shakes by the end of the morning like it's <laughs> incredible <laughs> but um it's just a it, it has such a beautiful flavor and how do you pass that experience on to the end consumer after it's been fermented, after it's been aged in oak, all these things. Like how do you connect where that wine, where those grapes are grown into the wine that you're drinking? And I think being as true to the vineyard as possible is the best way to really um, have a wine that stands out from, from any others. Just like with cooking, you can put all kinds of sp spices in and make something really yummy. But if you were to pick all of those things out, it just, it tastes good together. It's sauce, right? Like you can have oregano and basil and all these things in there and it's just good sauce. But um, if you want to taste just the tomatoes, you just have to, you know, keep it really simple, right? So I feel like winemaking is a little bit like cooking in that way. It can be really good. It, you can paint with all different colors of of, um, on, on the palette and make something really beautiful, but you can also have a really pure expression of something. And that's kind of what I want to stay true to when we make this wine. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Yeah, it has a, a little bit of a bite to it as well. Well, it definitely has tannins. Cabernet does, it gets it from the skins, gets it from the barrels. Um, it can change depending on a lot of things. Um, you probably all just received your wine yesterday, maybe even some of you today. So shaking it up in transit can kind of um, bind up the tannins a little bit. So sometimes if you decant a wine, let it sit open. If you just open this bottle versus um, had it open for an hour, it will change. And if you continue your Friday night with this bottle, you'll see how it changes in the glass and you'll see how it changes if you eat something with it too. So if you're having some cheese, you said Manchego is probably a really good um, cheese to have with this wine. Um, I always go for just a really mild brie. Also, I feel like the creaminess with the um, with the tannins and the sort of the balance between the the um, the rigid darkness of um, Cabernet and just the light creaminess of a cheese is, is a nice balance, kind of a contrast, you know. So um, that's one of the beauties of wines that it changes so much depending on where you're having it and you know what you're having it with that wasn't a negative by the way <laughs> oh yeah no i mean it's it's not it's actually that kind of structure um helps the wine age too you know so when we got into this we had no idea you know about how long people were going to age this wine like there was no plan there was no like marketing plan like let's hold some you know, to see, to sell it as library later on. I have um, seven bottles of our first vintage in my daughter's closet. And um, so that was the 07. And we pull a bottle out every now and then and taste it. And it's so good. It's holding up. So we know it ages that long, <laughs> um, 13 years. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun. Do, do you anticipate? This is Jeff. Um, do you anticipate this one? Uh, it's not overly tannic. Um, it's really rounded. Do you anticipate this one being able to lay down for 10 years? I mean, it, it drinks yeah. great right now. Yeah. Uh, and it'll, 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 I, I would say 10 to 15 years um, is sort of my guess with just what we've seen with this wine. We're not 15 years in yet, but I, I, there's still plenty of fruit left and great structure with the 07, our first vintage. So it, all the wines have been aging really well. Um, we didn't build it to age for 25, 30 years, like some of, you know, some of the Bordeaux can, can age for. If we had more oak on there, I think that it would keep the structure, but, but we just don't know. We just, we're not that many years into it, but um, I can say for sure a decade is gonna be fine. If you can hold on to it for that long, that's my, that's my problem. <laughs> 
That's, that's the hard part is not drinking it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, if we have any last questions, we're going to have to get off um, the Zoom because we have to get ready for the other um, Q&As with the filmmakers. Um, is there any one last question? We can, we can take one last question and then we're, we're going to have to say goodbye to all you lovely people. I want to know oh. how Jeff ends up keeping his wines that long. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just can't seem to do that because they're so good. This is excellent. This is excellent. It's got a very nice yeah. uh, start and finish. And, and uh, like color. you said, it's, um, I love the color. it's not, it's not a real big chewy cab. It's so drinkable that if I had a lot in my cellar, I wouldn't be able to keep it that long. <laughs> but one question I wanted to ask is, do you have any wine saved that you made in the year of your children's birth? I dropped the ball on that. So 2009, I think I know where I can get a bottle of it, one bottle of it. And 2011, there was just this terrible green mold. And so it's the only year that we didn't make wine off of that vineyard, um, which I'll break it to you now, we're not making wine off of it this year either. Um, so my son was born in 2011 and we don't have an 11 bottling. So I have other wines, 2009 and 11 stored for the kids, but not ours, which is just terrible. And those kids, I'll tell you, have been at almost every single pick. They get up at three o'clock in the morning and we, we live 40 minutes from the vineyard. So we drive to get there at three, 3.30 in the morning. And they'll sit in the back of the car until it's light enough for them to go out. But they have their headlamps on and they come and help sort, you know, pick the leaves out of the bins. And they're there probably mostly for the donuts, but they're there every single year and they would not miss it. They get out of school for a little while in the morning. That might be a draw too, but they are, have been a part of it since they were babies. It's, it's really wonderful. Well, it's it's wonderful that you get to walk the vineyard. I mean, walking vineyards is so peaceful. And congratulations on your wine. This is excellent. And also, I have to shout out to Shira because this festival has just already been amazing. And oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, on that note, um, Rachel, why don't you give one more time where they can order wine um, on your website? Give them that address. Yeah, so please, if you're interested, we'd love to talk with you. Um, if you want to order wine, it's stellariswine.com. And on the um, little insert that came with your wine at the very bottom, there's a discount code that please, you know, use that. And um, if you ever come this way, please look us up and we'll take you out to the vineyard and do a tasting with you. We have a, um, a sweet little tasting room that we have access to in St. Helena that we can host you, um, social distance hosting you. Um, if you're in Mammoth, um, Petra's has some older vintages of the wine. They might even have some of our Grenache. Um, the Mogul has a couple bottles of Grenache um, that we kind of slipped them when I was there last year. Um, so it might even not be on the list. You might have to just ask for it. Um, but so there's a little bit floating around Mammoth if you're, if you're there too. But um, Mammoth is near and dear to my heart. Um, I lived there for a few years. My dad lived there for almost a decade. And um, so any chance I get to be connected with Mammoth, anything that, that they do, um, I like to be a part of that. And then our, my bag line is sold at the mountain with the Mammoth Mountain logo on it. So that's another really special, special thing to do, so yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you all. Thanks Thank for being you, here Rachel. and enjoy the rest of the film festival. And, and tomorrow night's tasting with Dave uh, Masterscheidt. He's a dear friend. I've met him um, years and years and years in a row to go to the Mammoth Food and Wine. Um, and um, he has great wines too, and you'll have a really fun tasting. So. Cheers, you guys. Happy yes, Friday. Cheers, and thank you, everybody, for supporting the festival. And thank you, Rachel, for bringing your amazing uh, wine to our festival. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Hope you still see some more films tonight. Good night. <laughs>